You know, I think I, I just hit 65 this year, and, I, and not that that's a, a magical age, but I don't know why we all, when we retire, we all start by saying our age. <laughs> like there's a certain number that you think, well, at this point, I'm not gonna be working after this point. But uh, I think um, it actually was two years before that when I was negotiating my, my last contract, and even then I thought, there's a certain point where it's not like there's any action forcing event, but you just feel like, let's go do something else. I've been covering news in Washington for uh, 43 years. I started in 1980 and, um, or 41 years. I started in 1980 and uh, I've lived here since 1978. And it's funny because I, <laughs> I went to American University, which is like three blocks up the road. And I tell people in, in 43 years, I didn't get very far. I just went, <laughs> I've only come like half a block. But I, I think there was just a point where you just think you have to let go and you, you don't want to stagnate and uh, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. What's the point of that? Because you're afraid? Because you're afraid of doing something else? Because you're afraid you don't know what you're going to do? You got to let go and go out. You're not going to be able to find a new path if you don't leave the one you're on. So I, I felt like it was, it was going to be time. And if I ended up just mowing the lawn and, uh, and growing cabbage, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what are you doing these days? I'm mowing the lawn and growing cabbage. You know, it's, it's things you have to, you have to let go so things come to you. And, and that's sort of how I felt. So there was not, and, and, and again, during that time, just this year, in the last seven months, um, I, I, I got a, a fairly uh, a stunning diagnosis. And that sort of said to me, sort of validated the direction I was heading in. So it was now, well, you were planning on retiring, you know, six months from now. Seems like it really makes sense now. There's no reason to be afraid. You have something else to be afraid of. Uh, so keep so keep going. It, it just made it just made sense. And friends of mine who are still doing what they're doing and bitching about how much they hate it. And I go, why don't you retire? And it's amazing how many excuses we'll come up with that are just another way for us to say I'm afraid. And I want to say of what I'm more afraid of not doing something new. I'm more afraid of stagnation than I am of of a frontier that I that that is a landscape that is new to me you know I was just talking to someone in the newsroom about um, you know do you want to take Tai Chi <laughs> I actually and I said this on the air the other day and I'm and and I have friends going you're gonna learn to play the cello who are you friends who've known me for 30 years. You are going to play the cello? Who are you? And uh, I was joking that I'm going to play myself off, you know. Uh, I've always thought it was just such an elegant, beautiful instrument that you wrap your body around it and you embrace it. And I thought, what would be more glorious than to feel that instrument, you know, vibrating through you and, and to try to understand it and master it? I may never. I mean, you know, I, I'm joking that instead of uh, you got Yo-Yo Ma and they'll call me No No Mas. Like, we'll pay, we'll, I'll put a cup out that says we'll stop playing for money. <laughs> um, I'll probably make a lot. But uh, I just want to try, I just want to try new things. Plus my husband, I recently was married and my husband was in this business for 37 years. He's one of our cameramen. And I've watched him the last three or four months. I think he just, he just retired. And I watch him at every afternoon. He makes his little French press coffee and has his peanut butter, almond butter toast. And then he goes for a glorious walk. Or if it's pretty, because he's a big cyclist, he goes for a bike ride. And I'm going out the door to go do the news. And I'm like, what, what? You know, so, you know, there's, you have to look around and see the, the small glorious things in life that it doesn't have to be, well, I've got a bucket list. In fact, uh, someone said you need to take bucket list and replace the B with an F. And I have, and uh, that's my list. 
But you, it's not about, although Dan would like to do a transatlantic, the Queen Mary transatlantic, and uh, over to Southampton. So we're, we're kind of planning on that. But in general, I just want to uh, kind of quietly live my life. And if something big and fun comes along, I want to be able to do it. And if it's just, there's this road out in Rappahannock County where our mountain home is, and it's called Fodder Stack. Some of you may know it. It connects the back road from Little Washington to Flint Hill. It's a ball buster. Then Dan can do it because he's a big cyclist. Even though I did the A's ride for three years in a row, I mean, I get on that thing and I am cussing the last. It's a very hilly road. So we keep, I keep saying to him, we need to do fodder stack again. We need to do fodder stack. I'm doing fodder stack. That's on my, you know, that's on my list of things to do. We're getting on our bikes and we're doing fodder stack, you know. I remember one time I was walking it, power walking it, and some guy was, you know, huffing and puffing, and I thought, does anyone know how to do CPR? Because by the time, I was with my girlfriend, I said, by the time that guy on the bike gets to us, he's going he's gonna to collapse. So as he came up, you did the bicycle thing, where it's like, look and good, look and good. I don't know why we think that helps. And as he got to me, he kind of choked out, I don't feel good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know, this road sucks. <laughs> But to be able to do that road and to try it and try it and try it, that would be kind of great. I once cut my, all my hair off. I just wanted a short haircut and I was doing it bit by bit by bit by bit. And then um, my stylist said, just do it. You know, just do it. You've got the face for it, just do it. And this hair, my hair was like this long. My hair grows very, very, very slowly. This was, I remember at the time I was dating a guy and uh, not dating but kind of dating a guy starting to date a guy and he actually texted me and said I said I'm I'm he says something is effective you know you're really an attractive woman except for that haircut <laughs> Have you ever dated in the Washington area it's a trip it's a trip but that is 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 the, the thing it took me years two years to grow that haircut out and uh, that would be if I could change anything. And of course, they have it in the hallway. And I, I always say, can you guys take this picture down? The other picture is a picture of me from like eight years ago, but they airbrushed it so much. I look like a like a 17-year-old Christy Brinkley that they took when I was, you know, 57. It's like really windy. I know you and I go, okay, that's, <laughs> they could have laid off the airbrush a little bit. It's a little bit heavy handed. But uh, that short haircut, oh man, I will never do that again. And then I have friends that forever acted like I had committed murder. Don't you ever, ever cut your hair that short again. It's like, oh, all right, everybody calm down. For people in my business starting out is, I, especially when you're on the air, is you must let people see who you are. You have got it's very easy to do an affectation and to be imitating, you know, and yesterday, so and so, and, up, 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 and that's, that's a phony wall that you're putting up. Um, it's easy to hide behind it, but you really have to be vulnerable. You have to show them. We're, we're, being, we're being allowed to, we're being trusted with people's stories. And, and, if, in, and in order to tell them well, you have to feel it. And if that means you get emotional, let them see you. Let them see you get emotional. You know, you have, to, you have to feel it. You cannot, we're not robots, and we're not facades, and we're not mannequins, and we're not cardboard cutouts. We're human beings that have been trusted by the people of the community to tell their stories, and, and most of their stories are sacred. And we really need to show, show them who we are. You don't see a, a priest or a minister get up there and do a, you know, to do something phony, at least I hope you don't. You're in the wrong church if you do. You, you really not let, have to let them see who you are and not who you want them to think you are because they'll see right through that. And uh, they'll never connect with you. I mean, you wouldn't, you have your friends because you've been intimate with them and told them, let them see who you are. And, and it's not about your Facebook or your Instagram where you're just a fabulous person in a fabulous gown going to the Kennedy Center or bop, 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 bop. No, let them see who you are, what matters to you. And, let, and that's going to come out in your writing. And that's going to come out uh, in who you are. It's, it's just naturally comes out. Don't you agree, Tanil? Yeah. you got to let them see who you are. 
And this, you know, fake it till you make it. I, I heard that once after I was old and thought, I don't even know what that is. To me, it's like fall on your face until you make it. That's how, that was my strategy. I just fell on my face until I made it. And, um, you know, people, because you're real and people, people appreciate that. I remember a guy came to inspect my deck and it was right after a, a story that I'd done about these friends that had been killed in a, a private plane crash on their way back from fishing together. And this, we'd been out there for a week while they were looking for the plane. And it was horrible. And th this was at least 25 years ago, and it still makes me cry. And when they found their bodies, um, they found the wreckage, we had gotten to know their relatives so well that it broke our hearts, broke my heart, to see these people who had become my friends devastated by the loss of their husbands, their brothers, their boyfriends. And I started crying like this on the air because I was, and I said to them, I'm sorry. I apologize to the viewers, but I said, I'm sorry. But we, these people, we've been out here for a week while they've been searching by this uh, search and rescue. And we've gotten to know these people. And I said, it, it, it's kind of heartbreaking. I can't, I just, I can't do it. I can't just sit here and go and just spew out facts like I'm a, a wire machine. I'm a human and it broke my heart to see them heartbroken. And now I've cried. Thank you, Tennille. Now you know it's me. I am a faucet. I used to work with Susan Kidd and she used to say to me, because I cry easily, and, and she, and that's one thing I would change, I wish I, I'd gotten better. I just have never developed a thick skin. And she cried easily. And she used to say to me, don't you start crying. And if you cry, don't you look at me. Don't you look at me. Because she and I were both faucets. There were times we couldn't get through the five o'clock show. <laughs> both of us just sitting there crying. And she would, during the commercial break, I told you not to look at me. And it's like, oh, I can't help it. Then I started crying because she scared me. So <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, be yourself. Don't be afraid to cry. It's very human. And believe me, in this business, if you can get through this business and not cry, there's something wrong with you. There's just, you get to see fate visit the worst misery and sorrow upon people. And then often you're the one knocking on their door to see if you can get a, just a picture or a, a soundbite. And it's not easy and they often let you in and, and sometimes I would sit there and think, please don't let me in, please don't let me in, please don't let me in. These, these are really sacred, holy places in these living rooms where these people are in the early stages of their grief because of something stupid. So utterly, utterly stupid that another human has done to a, a human, mostly often a child. And you can't tell that story you know, you just cannot tell that story and, and just be, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just a news person telling a story. Uh, you just can't be. You just can't be. Don't be. If you are that way, stop it. Don't be that way. We have a cast of characters behind the scenes that you guys don't know. And then you have one in front of the scene that has been my, my, my work spouse, Jim Hanley. This is the funniest human on the planet. And I'm pretty funny myself. And the two of us, if we were in eighth grade science class, they would have separated us long ago. They do call us things they used to. They used to text us during commercial breaks. What is so funny? Because we would have sometimes have trouble just getting through. <laughs> Because what they do here, the writers, if you've got a long name of some terrorist and it's, you know, he's got like, well, he's got a name that's 15 feet long. And then they'll do the phonetic afterwards. So you have, it rolls up in the prompter. It's just 30 pages of just this guy's name. I pre-read my copy just so I know what landmines are, are, are in it.
my boy, Hanley, doesn't always pre-read because he's over there on the phone and on Facebook and he's busy, 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 my little chipmunk. And I'll, I'll be looking at my thing, looking at the prompter and I'll think, oh my God. And I just love to watch him <laughs> verbally just, I love to watch the whole undercarriage of his little car just come off on the road as he hits, he hits this name and it's so funny that then I can't now, you know, now it's my turn to read the next thing and I just can't, I can't go on, I can't go on. And sometimes we actually physically turn away from each other. So we can't physically, let me just drop something. We can't physically see each other because if I'm <laughs> seeing him, after something has happened, oh my God. And then sure enough, commercial break, the managers are calling us, what? What are you two laughing about? It's like, you're not gonna find it funny. You had to be there, you know, anyway. So I will miss, I will always miss my boy Hanley. Fortunately, he and I go out to dinner periodically and we do the same thing at restaurants. So uh, one time people at the table, said we were too loud you know we were there with some other people it wasn't just us but they people complained and we were like what's going on you know then you leave you know so yeah i'll miss hanley and i'll just miss coming in here i think you know uh coming down the road for 33 years our our road that leads into here is home you know it's 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 home it's something that's familiar and i think things that are familiar to us which is why i think people are afraid to leave because you just feel like everything kind of clicks into place, you know? And, and even just coming down the road, but you have to be afraid to let go and kind of click into something else.